Well, that'll get you going. Show you a picture here this morning that uh, kind of got pulled out of some family archives. Here, it'll come up on the screen. That little lady in the middle is my grandmother, Agnes May Gilligan. Didn't you see the cutest little thing you ever saw? <laughs> she was one of a kind, and those are, are two of her brothers. On your left, that's Walter. And then on your right, her left, <clears throat> is her brother, Harry. Now, I knew my grandma really well. I grew up living literally right next door to my grandma. Didn't know her brothers all that well. You would interact at family events, this kind of thing. This so next picture is, is Harry, then, her brother, and his wife, whose name happened to be Vera. We'll show you that picture here of that couple. I didn't know them that well, but every so often, they just show up, just kind of unannounced. You didn't know they were coming. They just come pulling in the driveway. Again, you know, I live next door to my grandma. Usually it was on a Sunday. Maybe I'm outside playing or something like that, and all of a sudden, Uncle Harry and Aunt Vera would just show up and kind of near, near the end. I don't think Aunt Vera could move around real good, and so my grandma would come out of the house, and she'd just go over, and they'd roll the windows down, and she'd just kind of stand there, lean in the car, and they'd just kind of chat it up and catch up on things, and talk and stuff. My Uncle Harry, whenever he'd see me, you know, I'm just a little kid, like that first picture was probably taken some time in the late 70s, I would guess. Whenever, whenever he would see me, he, he, when we were leaving, if I was going or he was leaving, he'd say to me, I'll see you in the funny papers. <laughs> I don't know what that meant. <laughs> Still don't know what it meant. To be honest, kind of creeped me out, right? <laughs> see you in the funny papers. Okay, glad you're leaving. You know, you're kind of thinking that kind of thing. But here's the thing. They'd, they'd show up and Stick around for a little while, I don't know, half an hour or whatever, and then they'd leave. And I'd, I'd say to my folks, why was Uncle Harry here? My mom or dad would say, well, they're just kind of out and about. I'd say, well, were they here for a reason? they said, no, they were just out taking a Sunday drive. It's kind of out just driving around on a Sunday. Have you ever heard that term before? It's like, where, you just, you're, where are you going? I don't know. Just kind of driving. You got a mission? Nope. It's kind of out on a Sunday drive, just kind of cruising around, checking stuff out, seeing how construction's going. I don't know, right? <laughs> Just kind of a Sunday drive. And, and, you know, from time to time, people do that kind of thing. Sometimes maybe you do that kind of thing. You just kind of get out. You slow down a little bit. A lot of times people would do it on the weekends. You call it a Sunday drive. Earlier this year, I had a, and I'll probably tell you about this later on in this series, but I had this moment where I was sitting in my car going, man, a lot of life has passed me by. You're just, you're just kind of looking back and thinking at things that I probably failed to appreciate in the moment. Times when you go, I don't know that my priorities were always right. I don't know that I always made the best decisions. And isn't it amazing how the days turn into weeks and the weeks turn into months and the months turn into years and before too long, there's a whole lot that was there that you're, that's just now passed and you kind of just miss the whole thing. Does anybody else know what I'm talking about? <laughs> right, you have these moments sometimes. It was interesting that when, when that was, it was like really heavy in my brain, I felt like the Holy Spirit kind of whispered a little bit and said, you know, that'd be a good thing for Calvary to talk about. Just kind of at times, if you're not careful, life will go cruising right by you. There's a book in the Bible that really helps us to talk about that a lot. It's a book called Ecclesiastes. If you have your Bibles, turn there with me. It's in the Old Testament, right after Psalms and Proverbs. We're going to spend the next few weeks, and we're going to look at this kind of curious, very interesting, unique book in Scripture called Ecclesiastes. We've called this series Sunday Drive because a Sunday drive slows you down enough to think about what drives you. Like, what is it that really drives your life? And there are times in life when it's good to kind of slow down a little bit and think about what is it that, that drives me. The book of Ecclesiastes is interesting. You know, we have different categories. If you can remember, about this time last year, we looked at the different books in the Bible. And there's a category in Scripture called the wisdom books. It's, it's Job, it's Psalms, it's Proverbs, it's what, the Song of Solomon, sometimes called Song of Songs, and it's Ecclesiastes. And Ecclesiastes is this interesting book, whereas when you read Proverbs, you get all kind of these little sayings, these little quotes that kind of tell you how life should be. <laughs> Ecclesiastes is interesting because sometimes it tells you how life really is. And it kind of is very realistic. There's a lot of just... Hard truth in the book of Ecclesiastes. In fact, sometimes people will even say it's kind of pessimistic. Now, if you're an optimist, you, you look at the book of Ecclesiastes and you say, why is this guy such a downer? Why is his glass always half empty? If you're a pessimist, you look at the book of Ecclesiastes and go, I love things that are realistic, right? That's your thought. 
And it's this interesting book that actually is very realistic. There's some debate about who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. Certain people want to go back and forth. Here's what's commonly believed, and this is the assumption we're going to work off of, that Solomon, the king of Israel, wrote the things that we're reading. You'll you'll see here in just a moment, he kind of calls himself out here. And even though there's a little bit of debate, whether it was Solomon that actually took pen in hand to write these words, we believe they're his words, he never refers to himself by name, He simply called the teacher, Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse one, the words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Verse 12 of that same chapter, he says, I, the teacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. So we believe the words came from him, and when you read it, it seems to be that he's reflecting back on his life. He's probably an older man at this point. He's looking back on his life, and he's thinking about what really mattered And it seems to be that he's writing to young people and saying them, I want you to learn from my experience. I want you to pick up some things that I have had happen to me so that you can learn from those things. And at the very beginning of the book, he asks this really probing question. Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse three. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Interesting question. What do you gain from all your hard work? What are you gaining from everything that you're putting your hands and your your mind and your might to do? You know, I wonder if this wasn't part of that ritual of the Sunday drive. And on Sunday, you slow down enough to ask, what am I doing this for? What is this really all about? Maybe the big question that we're going to ask throughout this series is, what drives you? Like, what is it that motivates you? What gives you focus and purpose and meaning? When you get out of bed on Monday, what is it that drives you in those times? The question might be, what drives you? Can I call out a few things? Like, like as I read through these first two chapters of Ecclesiastes, that's as far as we're going to get today. We're just going to kind of do a quick cruise through the first two chapters. As I looked at, there's some questions that I think Solomon asks us about what drives us. Like, one of those things is, are you driven by work? Is it your job? Is it that obligation? Is your purpose your paycheck? Is that what motivates you the most? Are you driven by your job? Because if you are, here's what Solomon says. Ecclesiastes chapter two, verse 22. What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they labor under the sun? All their days, their work is grief and pain. Anybody got an amen to that one? (laughs) Even at night, their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. Really happy guy. Have you noticed that? And we're going to talk about hard work later. Look, this is no excuse to be lazy. He has real value in a work ethic. He's just painting a big picture here. And he says, if all you're driven by is your work, it's meaningless. How about this? Are you you driven by the latest and the greatest? Like we live in a world where fads and trends and the newest, shiniest thing Is for many of us the thing that drives us and motivates us, the thing that we put value in. People are always looking for bigger, better, faster, smarter. What is that new cell phone that's being launched? What's that new song I should be listening to? There's always something new and better. Here's what Solomon says, Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse nine. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new? It was here already, long ago. It was here before our time. No matter. Isn't there kind of that uh, (laughs) Eeyore tone that's there? Right? Look, trends come and trends go. It happens, right? Think about the world of fashion, right? Are there any pictures of you that you wish you say to yourself, why did I wear that? I guarantee you my Uncle Harry regrets that collar. Do you know what I'm talking about, that picture earlier? Because fashion trends come, fashion trends go. If you're driven by the latest and the greatest, it's going to let you down. How about fame or power? Is that something that drives you? Are you driven by fame or power? Look, without being critical, many of us would like to do something that matters and makes a difference. We want to advance. We want to lead more. I had a conversation with a friend earlier this week, and she was saying to me, I just, I just feel like my gifts are underappreciated where I work. Like I've got more to offer 
And those that are above me don't seem to recognize that. And I'm doing my best and I'm serving and I'm making myself better. And I know the projects that I turn in, they have value. And I know I'm helping the company. I just would like to be challenged with something more. And that's actually a really healthy thing, isn't it? That if you feel like you've got something to give to say, how do I give? How do I do that? I actually think that's biblical. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17 says, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In fact, Solomon would agree with that. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10. He says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. But here's the reality check. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 11 No one remembers the former generations, and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. Fame, power, doesn't last. This is the realism of Ecclesiastes. Maybe you're driven by knowledge. How much more can I know? How much more can I learn? How much more information can I have? We have so much knowledge literally at our fingertips today, but how does it affect the big scheme of things? Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 15. Solomon says, And I said to myself, The fate of the fool will overtake me also. What then do I gain by being wise? I said to myself, This too is meaningless. He seems to like that word, doesn't he? <laughs> meaningless. How about this? Are you, are you driven by pleasure? Now, oftentimes when we use the word pleasure, we tend to think in a negative way, harmful, obsessive, sinful. And sometimes... But sometimes they're pleasures that God has allowed us to experience, things that we enjoy, things that we like, things that are good for us. But if that's what drives us, here's what Solomon says, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 1, I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be, anybody? <laughs> Meaningless. He likes that word. Last one, are you driven by money? Is it finances, what you can have, possessions, things? Is that what drives you? He had it all. That's his point. He's looking back at his life. And he says, look, I had everything. Watch this. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 10. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor. And this was the reward for all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, Everything was a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. How about that language? It was meaningless. Chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. You ever played one of those uh, claw games? You know, like when you go to an arcade or sometimes they'll have them in restaurants or malls or whatever that has all the, the toys, stuffed animals, all that stuff inside of there, and it has that claw so you can try to get stuff out. Do you know what I'm talking about? So like you call up your, your broker and you cash out your retirement in quarters, right? And you go over to the thing and you just start feeding them in there, right? You just start putting the money in there because you see that teddy bear or that minion or whatever it is that you're like, I've got to have that. And so you start putting your savings in there and the clock comes down and you know you got it right in the right spot. Grab that little bear around the neck. You know what I'm talking about? And you pick that thing up. You get it right over to the exit and what happens Falls right back out again, over and over and over again. Like, I've, I've, never, I've never done it, but like, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, <clears throat> you spend your time playing the game. You feed your resources into it. You obsess over what might be yours only to experience one heartbreak after another. And what do you find yourself with at the end? You find yourself with... So is Solomon saying that life is just one big claw game? No, he's not that pessimistic. And yes, that's exactly what he's saying. <laughs> it's what he's trying to communicate to us, not to burst your bubble, because many of those things we talked about are good. Those things that we said you might be driven by, those six things we just walked through, they're not bad things. They're things that are a part of life. There are things that can motivate us. But what he's saying to us is this, Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse three, what do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? He's asking you a question. He's saying, what drives you? What motivates you? And this is just the first two chapters. He brings us to this harsh reality 
Look, I've never taught through this book before. Hits, hits and misses, bits and pieces from time to time. It's an interesting book. It's filled with a lot of wisdom. At times, it's a little depressing. <laughs> Sometimes it's kind of confusing. It's filled with a bunch of quotes and one-liners that we'll remember, and you'll go, oh, I didn't know that came from Ecclesiastes. But as we cruise through this book, there's some things that are good for us to see, and one of the things is this, that it's good for us to slow down and think about our lives and ask the question, what is it that drives me? Today, as we kind of start this series, I want to show you three things that Solomon is going to say over and over again. You're going to hear him repeat these phrases. You're going to hear him say these things as we work our way through this book. And they're important to understand what it is that he's trying to communicate because these are things that will help you to see the big picture of the book of Ecclesiastes. They're kind of three reminders in Ecclesiastes that we're gonna look at today that are gonna help us as we go through this book. So let me give you three reminders in Ecclesiastes. Here's the first one. Number one, everything is meaningless. Amen? (laughs) Right, here's this guy, Solomon. And he gives us, in verse 1, an introduction. He says he's the son of David and the king of Israel. And then he goes right to it in verse 2. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 2. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Do you think he's trying to say something? Actually, 38 times you're going to see that Hebrew word there for meaningless. Is he trying to be... uh, over over dramatic is he trying to say too much no he's probably just giving the brutal honest truth you can't tell me you haven't woken up one morning and said to yourself what is this all about you're sitting there eating your cereal you're looking in the mirror wondering why your hair looks like that you're saying these things to yourself and going what's the use what is it really all about Maybe you're familiar with the King James version of that same verse. Very kind of familiarly, it says Ecclesiastes 1 verse 2, vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Here's the point that he's trying to make. He's trying to tell us that life is temporary. At its very best, the way that we live, the things that are around us, life is temporary. The word that he uses there is this Hebrew word, havel, And it has the idea not just of meaningless or this idea of vanity, but behind it, when you get to the very kind of heart of the word, it has this this idea of breath or of smoke or of a vapor, something that is there for a moment and then it just disappears and vanishes. He says, your life is like a vapor. Your life is like a breath. Your life is like something that is there, but before you can grab a hold of it, before you can really fully realize it, before you can really experience it, it kind of disappears and is gone. Does anybody remember the 2016 election? Does anybody remember that? This isn't a political statement. You're okay. You can raise your hand, right? (laughs) Remember, it was kind of crazy, wasn't it? Everything leading up to it. Some of the craziness that got lost in some of the bigger national elections came from the city of Oceanside, California, because in Oceanside, there was an election for the city treasurer, and in that election, Gary Ernst was reelected, which didn't surprise a lot of people. People liked Gary. They voted for Gary. The problem was that a couple of weeks before the election, Gary had died, (laughs) and he still got reelected because they couldn't take him off the ballot because he he died within this 60-day window or so, so they couldn't change the ballots. And so the person who was higher up in the government there did not like who he was running against and had promoted vote for Gary even though he's dead because when he wins, then I can appoint whoever I want instead of that other person. That's what they did. Congrats, Gary. You're the winner. I feel bad for Gary. You ever won something? And then not been able to fulfill the promise? Not been able to enjoy it? Isn't that a picture for so many people what life is like? It seems like it's right there, and then it's gone. Life, Solomon says, is havel. It's a vapor. It's there for a moment, like like your breath. And then it disappears, like smoke. It's meaningless. Psalm 39, verse 5 says, You have made my life no longer than the width of my hand. My entire lifetime is just a a moment. That's that word, that havel, that, that breath to you. At best, each of us is but a breath. 
James 4, 14. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while, and then it vanishes. He says, what seems to be there is just temporary. It's there for a moment, and then it's gone. It's meaningless. Now, what he's not saying here is that your life has no meaning. Sometimes we, we read that there. Maybe when the idea should be futility, we hear meaningless, and so we start to think my life has no meaning. If you read through Ecclesiastes, you'll find out that that's not what he says. He says your life matters to your family, and your life matters to your friends, and you are to work hard and enjoy life and make the most of what you have. What he's saying here, though, is you need to realize that life is temporary, and life is fleeting, and life is not anything that you can just capture and hold on to. He's not contradicting the rest of Scripture. He's just being realistic. Do you remember what Paul said? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. He says to us, therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary. Isn't that what Solomon just said? What is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. When he says everything is meaningless, what he means is Life is temporary, and he also means that nothing is permanent. Life is temporary, nothing is permanent. That's the same thing, Chad. True. But understand this. So many times we expect certain things to be permanent. We expect that things will stay the same or that they'll last forever. And what Solomon shows us right at the beginning of this book is that that's just not true. Look at, look at verse 5, Ecclesiastes 1.5. He says, the sun rises... And the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. Have you ever had a night's sleep where it felt like the sun was speeding up on you? That it was hurrying back? Verse 6, the wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, and yet the sea's never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing nor the ear it's full of hearing. He says things just kind of keep going on and on and on. The days just kind of keep happening. And even though those streams just keep flowing, it seems like the seas never fill up. He says it's just, just life keeps going on and on like this. What's interesting about this is so many times what we want out of life is progress. We, we want to see something. We want answers. We want something we can hold on to. And what's interesting is Solomon says here, life isn't progress, life's a circle. <laughs> And at times, have you ever felt like you were on that hamster wheel? And it's just going round and round and round. And the reality is he says that things don't last forever. There's this interesting principle that I think it would be good for us to live with a little bit in our mind, with the idea that things are already broken. I don't mean that as a bit of a downer, but sometimes we we have certain possessions and we look at those things and we think that they will always stay the way that they are at the beginning that they'll be nice and shiny and new. But that's not necessarily the case. You might have something that's made beautifully out of glass, but you also have to realize that someday it could fall, and when it falls, it will. (laughs) It's gonna break, it's gonna shatter. If you'll know in your mind that someday that might break, that it's already broken, then you can enjoy it more when you have it. Like this is true in so many areas of our lives. The The glass can shatter and break. The car will get a dent in the door the very first time you drive it to the grocery store. Isn't that true? Right? Your shoes will eventually wear out. Those new pants you bought for your preschooler are going to be too short after they wear them twice. True? Right? This is how life happens. You can't have things forever. They are already broken. And when we try to make something permanent, we just frustrate ourselves. And this is what Solomon is trying to say. When he says everything is meaningless, he's saying everything is temporary. It's fleeting. It doesn't last forever. And if you try to hold on to it too tightly, you're going to be miserable in the end. He says you need to know that life is meaningless. It's temporary. It's Havel, he says. Which takes us to the second reminder that we see in Ecclesiastes. Number two, 
that we live under the sun. He says that we live under the sun. You're going to see Solomon say this a lot in this book. Actually, 29 times in the book, he uses this phrase, under the sun. And what he's talking about here is life from our vantage point, how we see things. See, the only way that we can see things is what's visual to us, what's visible to us through the light of the sun. So here we are under the sun, and what the sun shines on and shows us is the only perspective really we can have. See, living under the sun limits our perspective. It keeps us from seeing and fully understanding what's happening around us. And the reality is so many times we get focused on what we can see. We try to trick out our lives with what we can grab hold of only to find ourselves losing things and disappointed in the end because we get kind of caught up in what the sun is shining on. We get caught up in the things that are tangible and what we can see. And when we put too much into that, we end up making decisions that aren't wise. We choose things that won't last and ultimately we can find ourselves bailing on those things and having nothing to show for it. I grew up in Warren, Ohio area. That's Trumbull County, Northeast Ohio. One of the unique things about that part of the world, it's kind of up in the north, northwest corner of the county. There's like a collection of of Amish that live there. And so it's it's a little bit unique. So it wasn't unusual for us to go into a store or to see people in different places that were Amish or Mennonite or you know, the, the, the dress and all this kind of thing. And every so often, you'd even see people, if you got to different parts of the county, in a horse and buggy. Have you ever seen that? Like, you don't see it on Conant Street that much, but like, you know what I'm talking about? Like, every so often, you'll see the Amish in their horse and buggy. Just in the last couple of weeks, there was a horse and buggy that got pulled over by the police in Trumbull County because the police heard this crazy noise coming out of the buggy. Did anybody hear this story? It was interesting, when they pulled him over, when they saw the police, the two guys who were driving the buggy actually jumped out and took off. The horse is just going. The police are finally able to get the horse stopped. They go up to the buggy. What they find is a 12-pack of Michelob and the most tricked out stereo system you've ever seen. (laughs) These dudes had hooked this buggy up And they were just kind of bumping down the country roads, breaking the noise ordinances. It's not what you'd expect from the Amish. But they were grabbing hold of something that they could see. They tricked out their life with it. But in the end, they took off and they lost everything. Now, I know that's a goofy story, but that describes some of your lives. Where you've tried to grab hold of things that you can see. You've tried to trick out your life with things that seem to matter in the moment, but in the end, what Solomon say they are? He says they're, they're meaningless. And you find yourself in a place where you're having to bail on those things and you've got nothing left. Here's, here's the deal. When you look and you just focus on what you can see under the sun, what is under the sun is temporary at best. This, this is the point that Solomon's trying to drive home. It does not last. It's already broken. It's not going to last forever. So you have to about think about the things that drive you. Your work, the latest and the greatest, fame and power, knowledge, pleasure, money, all those things that we can see under the sun, realize those things aren't going to last forever. So this, this is a good place for us to stop what are you driven by? Like, what, what motivates you? What drives your life? Because there's good things for us to be motivated by. You, you might be motivated by your family. You might be motivated by effectiveness or by achieving your purpose or being a good steward of the resources that God has or wants to entrust to you. But we have to be careful because if those motivations go too far, they become control and power and fame and greed and they begin to mess our lives up. We're all motivated by something. In fact, I'll say this. I think it's okay to be driven by something. I like to be around people who are driven, who have purpose and meaning to their lives. The question you have to ask is, what are you driven by? And would Solomon say at the end of the day, does it even really matter? What is your Sunday drive? What is it that moves you? Because the first thing he says to us is that everything is meaningless. The second thing he says to us is, remember, you live under the sun. You can only see these things right now that are temporary at best. And the third thing, we all are chasing after the wind. Number three, we all are chasing after the wind. 
Here's a, here's a good summary statement. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 14. I've seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are, anybody? <laughs> a chasing after the wind. Thanks, Saul. He'd have been a great college football coach, wouldn't he? <laughs> what a motivator. He says, look, there's so much that has no value. It's already broken. You're just chasing after the wind. That phrase, chasing after the wind, that's really powerful. Like you, you, you get that, right? Because the wind is this thing that you just cannot control. Yeah, we, we try to use it. We fill our sails with it. We use it for turbines or for windmills or whatever. But you can't control it when it's there. It's there when it's not. It's not. And what the storms in the Atlantic just proved to us is that when it decides to show up, it does whatever it wants to do. True? But you can't grasp it. You can't hold on to it. No matter what you try to do, you can't hold on to the wind. And at some point, that elusive wind is going to get past you. And what Solomon says is this. He says, hey, everybody, I've seen it all. I've done it all. I've had it all. And now I'm looking back. Can I tell you? Everything you see here under the sun, I've been grabbing for it my whole life. It's like chasing after the wind. And in the end, if I had to describe it with one word, you know what that word would be? It'd be meaningless. And then when you get to the end of chapter two, like before he launches into the rest of the book, and we're, we're, we're gonna jump into chapter three next week, some very familiar stuff that you've probably heard before. Before he jumps into this, Solomon says this, chapter two, verse 24. A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? To the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom and knowledge and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. It's interesting what he says there. He says, look, do you know what God wants to give to you? God wants to give you happiness and knowledge and wisdom and enjoyment. God wants you to have meaning and purpose. He wants you to live a full life. He wants you to enjoy what he wants to give to you. He wants you to have strong relationships. He wants your work to matter. But what you'll find out is that unless you are driven by God, everything else that drives you is just meaningless. But if you start with God, if you make that your focus, then he loves to pour out everything else in your life. Solomon is looking back and he's saying, look, I spent far too much time trying to grab hold of things that just slipped through my fingers. Here's what I found out, that if you're driven by anything less than God, your drive is meaningless. But if you'll start with God, with God's purpose for your life, with God's plan for your existence, with God as your focus and your hope. If you'll start there, that's when life will start to make sense. Otherwise, you're not gonna get it. Look, life will not make sense under the sun with just what you can see. Life will not make sense under the sun. At some point, you have to start with your drive being driven by God, by Jesus Christ, by what he's done for you. When you start there, then it starts to make sense. Then the other things start to come together. But at first, you're just reaching for those things that you can see under the sun. What you'll find is it'll slip right through your fingers like the wind because then it's just meaningless. Walter Kaiser in his book on Ecclesiastes tells a story about when he was a student how he went to this exhibit where people were describing their artwork. So he was just kind of there, not much of a connoisseur of art, but he's just kind of watching the whole thing and different people would have their paintings and they would describe what they were, their sculptures describe what they were. And he said, one guy got up there and he began to, to tell them what he intended to communicate in one of his expressionist paintings. It was swirls of dark browns and blacks and greens and grays that were covering the canvas. He said, the guy very humbly got up there and he said, you know, when I finished my painting, I stood back and I looked at it and I said, it's really not speaking to me. And so I turned it on its side and I looked at it and I said, hmm, it's really not speaking to me. And Kaiser says in his book, he said, good, because it's not speaking to me either, he thought, right? <laughs> and he says, and the guy said, then I turned the painting upside down and then I saw what it was meant to say. 
And Kaiser says, that's the craziest thing I ever heard. <laughs> he's like, it, he's got the whole thing backwards. And it was interesting to hear him write and talk about this because he pointed this fact out that this guy was allowing his creation to speak to him as the creator. Isn't that backwards? Isn't the creator supposed to speak to the creation? And yet how many times do we do that? We go chasing after the creation when we should be chasing after the creator. And then when we finally figure out what it's all about, we stand back and we look at our lives and go, oh, I lived it upside down. <laughs> it wasn't right. It doesn't make sense until I see the way that it was supposed to be. And what Solomon is saying, he's saying, young man, young woman, those that are hearing my words, I'm telling you, if you're just chasing after what you can see under the sun, you're gonna find out that it's meaningless. He says, someday don't do what I did. Don't step back, look at the whole thing and say, oh, I lived it out upside down. He's saying, I want you to realize that unless God is the focus, unless he's what drives you, Everything else that drives you will be meaningless. I don't, I don't mean to spoil the end for you, but let me fast forward. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. He says, now all has been heard. Here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of mankind. Everything else outside of God, if that's what drives you, you're gonna find that it's meaningless. Everything under the sun, it's just chasing after the wind. But, 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 if you'll go, if you'll go above the sun, if, if, you'll, if you'll move beyond the sun, if you'll stretch and be driven by the one who is your creator, then he'll show you what life's supposed to look like and you won't stand at the end of your life and go, oh, I lived it upside down. <laughs> You'll live it with purpose, you'll live it with meaning. See, that's what we see over and over happen in the Gospels, don't we? That all these people keep coming to Jesus. Some of them come to Jesus because they're tired of the rules. And some of them come to him because they're tired of empty religion. And some of them come to him because they're hurting or they're sick or they're in pain. Some of them have questions, some of them have great wealth, but they're all coming to Jesus. And the reason they're coming to him is they're saying to him, I've been buying what everybody else has been selling and it just doesn't seem to be true and it just doesn't seem to be right. Can you give me the real thing? And you know what he sells them every time? He doesn't sell them anything. He gives them love. He gives them the truth, and he gives them purpose. And what Solomon says to us is unless your life is driven by God, unless Jesus Christ is the center of your life, you're gonna find out later that you were living life upside down and it was all meaningless. Does that make sense? That's why we talk so often about how important it is that you make the decision to have Jesus as your savior and as your Lord. When we use that word savior, we talk about the fact, and we, we shared with this when we had communion earlier today, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He paid the price for you and for me so that we could know what it was like to have forgiveness. Who doesn't want forgiveness? And he came to be our savior, but he also came to be our Lord, the one to whom we say you can have control. You, you can have the steering wheel of my life. God, you can direct me. I will let you be the drive in my life because that's when I find purpose and that's when I find meaning. In fact, for a lot of people, that's what they're searching for, a life that's actually meaningful, not meaningless, and that can only be found through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Look, have you ever, have you ever made like a, like a major purchase? Maybe you bought a house you bought a car, maybe you spent a lot of money on a, on a big TV or on a, on a computer or something like that, and in those moments, there's just kind of this tension of, do I spend this much? And you ask yourself questions like, how, how, how good a quality do I get? Do I want the very best, or am I okay with just kind of middle of the road, or can I only afford what's down here in the bottom? And then somebody's going to try to sell you a warranty, aren't they? There's always that upsell. I, I expect I'm going to have people offering me warranties when I eat a burger from now, right, you know? <laughs> Go through the fast food lane. You want a warranty on that cheeseburger? No, I'm fine. Right, but everybody's kind of asking, hey, do you want to protect that? Do you want to keep it new as long as you can? Like there's this, this pressure that comes with this when people are constantly selling, what are you going to do with this? Here's the reality. At some point, your house is going to need a new roof, right? <laughs> your transmission's going to go out. The technology's going to get old. What's shiny and new at some point becomes old and dull. And you have to realize that nothing lasts forever. I think sometimes we think that the, 
the church or that God is trying to sell something. He's not trying to sell you something that won't last. He's trying to give you the real purpose in life where real meaning is found. And here's my question. Like, I know you're here or you're listening to these words today because there's something that drives you to want to know what does God say about my life? How does the Bible direct my life? I'm gonna call that your Sunday drive because on this Sunday, these words are coming to you. My question though is, does your Sunday drive drive your Monday? How about on Wednesday, what matters? When you're making choices on Saturday, are they driven by those same things? Does your Sunday drive drive you the rest of the week? Because it's only when we're driven by God that our life will find purpose and meaning. So I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment. I'm really excited to to work through this book of Ecclesiastes because I think it's just gonna speak such, such truth to us in so many really practical ways in our lives. But today we started where Solomon starts. Kind of with maybe for some of us a little, little shake, a little wake up call to say, hey, what's, what's driving your life? I'm gonna pray a prayer in just a moment. And I would ask you to consider, are there things driving my life where I'm just chasing after the wind? I'm I'm going after these things under the sun, but in the end, they're just meaningless. When where I need to start is God being driven by you, by making Jesus Christ the most important person in my life, by letting him be my Lord and give purpose and meaning. Maybe today what you need is a little course correction in your drive. Say, God, would you help me to be driven by things that really matter by what will last or maybe even today's a day when you need to say God I can't do it on my own anymore and Jesus I need you to be my savior and bring forgiveness I need you to be my Lord and bring purpose to my life I don't want to live my life for things that don't matter I need meaning and purpose and so I surrender my life to you and so father as we come to you that's our prayer Holy Spirit, that you would search our hearts. And if there's places where we're being driven by things that are meaningless, would you shine a spotlight on that? Would you help us to realign our lives to your will? Would you help us that our choices and our decisions and our values and our drive would be focused on who you are and what will really last? Father, I I pray with the one who who right now is in a place where they say, I can't do this on my own anymore. Jesus, I need you to forgive my sins. I can't carry the weight of that shame and that guilt anymore. And Jesus, I ask you to be my Lord. Give my life purpose and meaning. I give my life to you. Help me to live it with you in mind. We thank you for your truth today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, look, if in your heart today you prayed to make Jesus your Savior and your Lord, then I would invite you on the way out that you would grab one of these cards. They say, I have decided, and uh, that you would take this to our Connection Center. There's friends who are there who would love to pray with you. We have a Bible we want to give to you. I want to answer any questions you have about what it might mean to be a Christian. If you're watching online, you can do that as well by going up to the top of our page at ToledoCalvary.org and uh, click on the button that says Jesus and you can find out some more there about how we can help you to grow in your faith. Thanks for being here today. I hope that this series will be something that's encouraging to you. Maybe you'll take some time, start reading ahead in the book of Ecclesiastes as we move forward. Have a great week. Go in his special favor and his wonderful peace. Thanks for being here.